Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, and a very warm welcome to you all to um, Morley College. Um, my name is Martin Maxwell, I am the college and deputy principal. Um, I'm really delighted that we've got such a wonderful full uh, house tonight, for what's going to be, I'm sure, a very stimulating and, and interesting evening. Um, before we start, can I just ask you a question? If you are new to Morley College, if you've never been as a student here before, or if you don't know much about the college, or just, you know, so the college just passing by, can you just put your hand up, please? Excellent, thanks very much. Um, I'm going to tell you, that for those of you who don't know Morley College, for those, for those of you who do know the college, let me just uh, tell you a little bit about um, our history where we come from. And I'm sure you know, a number of you will know probably some of the facts. Um, I'm going back to 1880, um, when Emma Combs, a visionary and social reformer who fought to improve the standards of living around the Waterloo area, leads to what is today known as the Old Vic, just, just over the road. Um, and she created the Royal Victoria Coffee and Music Hall, offering morally decent entertainment at affordable prices for the local community. Two years later, uh, in 1882, the Holy Camp hosted weekly penny lectures in which eminent scientists would address the public on a wide range of, uh, of topics. The, le the lectures were a huge success and quickly um, developed into evening classes. Uh, which then, in 1889, led to the establishment of Morley Memorial College for Working Men and Women. So, you probably have worked out by now that we are 125 years old as a college. And in order to celebrate our 125th anniversary, this year we have decided to revive the, the Penny Lectures and, and despite inflation and, and, and the rise in the cost of living, we've left the cost, the price, uh, uh, to one penny. Um, today we, we, we welcome um, to our first penny lecture of the summer term, um, Richard Reynolds, who will deliver a lecture called Gardening Without Boundaries. Um, Richard has had a, um, he's a guerrilla gardener, and he's had um, a long association with, with Morley College. Um, in fact, he has been looking after, for the last nine years, he's been looking after the, the gardens on the traffic islands just outside the college at the big junction. Um, about nine years ago, those, those um, traffic islands were just covered in, in weedy grass. And if you look at them now, you can surely have a look on your, on your way out later on, I'm sure it's still at light. They are a wonderful collection of plants, fruit trees, lavender, and, and, and so on. It's quite spectacular. Um, Richard uh, has also written a book on, on guerrilla gardening that has been published in English, German, French, and, and Korea. And he tours the world inspiring people to take part in this absolutely fascinating, interesting activity. And he will uh, tell us everything about that tonight. In fact, Richard will take us on a journey to discover the secrets of uh, guerrilla gardening. And, and we will hear tales of motivation, obstacles, and unexpected consequences uh, when you try and transform you know, forgotten patches of land into uh, something absolutely beautiful. So I do hope that you will enjoy the lecture tonight. And if you do, uh, you may want to think about perhaps making a little contribution or donation as you walk out. There is a big box there on the right. Um, any donation will go towards our uh, student bursary fund. It's a fund that we use to help students to pay for um, courses at Morley College for people who couldn't otherwise uh, afford to do that. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Richard Reynolds. Richard. Outside might get might get a mention in the introduction, so I'm actually going to get stuck straight in to talking uh, about that. Um, before talking about the, the variety of motivations that encourage people to garden land that is not theirs and to do so without asking first, which is the, the definition of what guerrilla gardening is all about. Um, but I also have some questions for the audience first. Um, 
Are there any familiar gardeners here tonight? I can, I can see one. Yes. Two. Yes, a few tentative hands. No, that's excellent. Um, anyone who, who considers themselves at least a, a gardener here tonight? Lots of hands. Brilliant. Okay. So, um, that, that second group are my target audience in particular <laughs> to convert you to, to gardening beyond the boundaries where you, where you currently have permission and, and hopefully reassure you that, that both the benefits and the risks are, are, are worthwhile. Um, so here we go, let's get started. This is where we are and this is what uh, was being described. This is what was outside Morley College um, in March 2006. So I'm not giving you a chronological presentation tonight, I'm getting straight stuck into the action because this is by far and away the biggest guerrilla garden that I've ever taken on and it's an incredible story of success, you know, long-term transformation. This is no, you know, hit and run, fly-by-night stunt, this is committed gardening. Um, and it was interesting that the use um, of the word relationship was, was made in the introduction as well because, um, of course, it's guerrilla gardening, so no relationship took place prior to the action happening, ha actually happening. This isn't more ecology's land anyway for me to, to approach, there's no question about that. Turns out um, the land is actually on the boundary between Lambeth Council and Southern Council. The boundary is that cycle path, which partially explains its rather sorry state, because it's that kind of marginal land that, that gets forgotten right at the periphery, um, compared with some of their more prestigious locations and of course parks. And to add to the confusion, and, and, and it sounds like I'm giving excuses now, but the Southwark part, which is closest to us here, had actually been devolved to Transport for London to look after, whereas the Lambeth part, as I understand it, is still considered Lambeth's rather than TFL's. So orphaned land, which by this point in my career, as I occasionally call it, um, I felt confident enough to take on. And so over four nights in March 2006, rallying support via my website, um, I got groups of about 25 people together, and, and we dug it up, and we planted a lot of lavender, and I invited people to bring anything they liked. I, I loved the idea that this place could just represent the, the whims and interests of the, the individuals who had come along and, and made their mark on it, uh, rather than conforming to any grand design or master plan, although I, I did bring the lavender and that, that voice does still to this day dominate. Um, and that's what it looked like at the peak of, of, of the lavender success. This is this photo is about four years old. So it really thrived. What it showed is that actually without huge amounts of effort, um, a, a fairly bleak space could be transformed into one that is not only uplifting, but nature friendly, fragrant, and, and bringing joy to all those who, who pass by, at least those who notice it. It's given us a great deal of positive feedback. And it's by far the most fun place to work on because the nature of the space, the traffic lights, the cycle path, the, the pedestrians who, who pass by, means that one ends up actually having a lot of social interaction. Whether it's the traffic stopping and chatting, the window ran down, the cab drivers cracking a joke. This is a place that has, has brought far more life than, than I ever expected that, that would come from gardening alone. Um, the tulips thrived for the first few years until the lavender um, overtook them and, and their natural shelf life expired. But this is fairly ever need any watering, it's a raised bed, these kind of plants have, have thrived in it. Um, and then uh, an incredible development took place where um, I learnt by chance from Transport for London that they were needing to remove some of this bed and, and was able to negotiate on the street with their contractor to uh, compensate us by building two new beds. So those who are familiar with the area will remember that two new beds were added um, in, in, in spring 2011. And I, I, I you know, drew the map out, described the, uh, the form of them to be you know, filled with topsoil, and it was all a bit hush-hush. I, I'm now actually very public about it, but the, the chap at Transport for London was a bit sheepish about what his superiors would make of this arrangement, but he was confident that we'd be able to take it on. So, so what you can see was beginning to happen is that by just being committed, by just doing it without asking, we were beginning to reassure people and the officials themselves that this was fine. Um, Lambeth Council invited me down to give talks about it at their Estates of Blue Awards. Um, a Southern Councillor even assumed it was the work of Southern Council. It was questioning me as to why I, you know, where, 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 where were all these guerrilla 
Charles, but I need to give a nice chat. I'm super tired, and I was able to put him in his place. And <laughs> um, we'll come on to Southern Council later on. Uh, a few more pictures of this one. Yes, it's had a few edibles in there. The eager eyed will have been able to harvest strawberries from it, raspberries. In fact, the raspberries have gone a little bit crazy and uh, need a bit of taming. Um, and we've had our own pests as well. <laughs> um, the, the, the Volkswagen beetle, but also the rosemary beetle. Gardeners might be familiar with that golden coloured ladybird, which has its UK hotspot um, in this area and thrives off not only rosemary, which gives it its name, but lavender. And so over the years, we've actually had to remove some of the weaker lavender. Um, but that's been a chance to bring in a greater variety of plants. And there's a lovely evergreen magnolia in there, and a hot lip sage, and lots of other plants that don't require too much water um, and bring, bring a lot more variety to it. It's also, this one case study um, answers the question of how, how can this be funded? Because of course, if you're not asking permission, then, then the chances of being able to apply for some kind of formal grant are, are pretty slim because they, they like organisations to be fairly buttoned down. But this is our cash crop. So every summer, normally around bank holiday in August, I get a group together. This is um, help us from the, the Kennington Garden Society. Um, cutting back the lavender, it's good for the plant, and it gives us a crop that we then harvest. Sometimes we even have royal assistance on, on that occasion, <laughs> which was a very helpful endorsement, I must say. Um, and, and then we make, we make these little lavender pillows. So I have brought a few along this evening. Um, I get the marketing plug-in now. They're available um, for an exorbitant price of £10 later on, but they're, they're well worth it, and we sell quite a few. And that goes into the kitty to pay for planting and, and looking after the rest of them. That is another version. So, that patch is just one of many in the local area. This is sort of zooming in in the immediate vicinity. You can see us up here uh, in the top left-hand corner. Um, and the Cottage Garden Avenue down London Road, which is currently um, doing very nicely. Um, and it's Road Pocket Park, which began as a gorilla garden and has been formalised more recently. <coughs> I'm going to touch on a few of these later on, and then zoom out and talk about some global stories as well. Um, on the map are also a few late lamented gorilla gardens as we um, uh, enter a phase of massive redevelopment in this area, particularly to the road network. So, and um, we'll touch on a few of those um, demised gardens and what consequences of those might be um, later on. So, I ended up in 2006 as a hobby um, setting up a website to record my nighttime activities gorilla garden and inadvertently kick started what is now a coherent but loose global movement. And I didn't realise at the time. When, when, when starting this, that actually the term had existed for a, a, a lot longer. It first been coined in, in New York in the 1970s. And this is that group, they were called the Green Gorillas, and they were transforming abandoned, neglected patches of what had been private land that had been fled, abandoning the city at a time of great flight and economic downturn. And the city had claimed ownership that students and activists and artists went in and began to create community gardens, which have a legacy today in the form of a network of community gardens in the Barry area, uh, Lower East Side. Um, and it took them 30 years, I'm giving you this story in a nutshell, it took them 30 years for these informal spaces to finally get the permission as parks. They got permission informally um, within about 18 months, but it was always vulnerable to, to the process of redevelopment because the land was classified as housing. So when I got to know people who'd been around in the early days and got to understand the story better, it, it really underlined the long-term potential of being committed to a space and how that really can change um, its, its role in, in the future. The, the, the battle is a long one, and it's not always a happy one either. A lot of their spaces were lost in, in those intervening years. So the, the blogging kick-started interest, a lot of media activity, which continues to this day. I had an inquiry from GQ India this week. We wanted some pictures. They're writing a story. We wanted to illustrate it. It comes from the most um, curious of places. And the interest, in turn, um, not only unearthed stories from existing gorilla gardeners, but encouraged a lot of people to come along and join in. And, and the media's been, been very useful, really, as a way of 
of spreading the word, but also giving it some kind of, of, of credibility and, and positivity, making it much harder for landowners to, to, to um, put people off or to, to stop the gardeners if, for whatever reason, um, they felt it was inappropriate. And, and those reasons are, are numerous, but um, are typically health and safety, you know, insurance, and, and long-term commitment. So I, I wrote a book a while ago, um, but it's, it's still very much available. Um, and this can now be seen, the evidence of this can now be seen online with um, a few logos here from groups a, around the world. And, and occasionally I get to meet some of them on my travels and better understand their motivations and, and uh, how they came to be doing it. And I'll touch on a few of these stories tonight. Um, just summing up actually the power of the web in, in, in sort of parallel with Guru Nagarjuna, it, it would be quite impossible um, for the movement to have become what it is today without the web and particularly now social media. And, and the one event every year that um, sums up the, the kind of loose connections between us is an idea that Brussels Guerrilla Gardeners started um, in, I think it was 2007, which is International Sunflower Guerrilla Gardening Day. And this is the page um, that I set up for it this year. Um, the, the Brussels group <coughs> were very keen that I sort of took the lead on <coughs> drawing up interest. And so you can see one, one, one and a half thousand people uh, joining it. Just another club. My voice was heard. Yes, that was. I shall whisper for a little while. Here are some sunflowers seed planting gorilla gardeners from, from around the world. Um, and the results from several sunflower efforts in, in London and beyond. So the, the meat of this evening's presentation um, is, is looking at the motivations. Um, I'm keen to emphasize that it is a very diverse activity. Um, occasionally the, the, the media and, and detractors particularly try and stereotype guerrilla gardeners. Um, there was an article at the end of last year in, in, the, in the Guardian which said that guerrilla gardening symbolized everything that was wrong with society, which was quite disappointing. <laughs> Well, they were trying to, I mean, perhaps it's a compliment, I don't know. But um, <laughs> it, the, the, it, at worst, is stereotyped as a, a prank, a short term sort of bit of mischief that, that isn't really about gardening at all. Um, and so, what I try to do to, to counteract that is to demonstrate the diversity. And these are the three broad areas that I think motivate why most people do it. That is, most people in, in developed uh, urbanised countries um, like ours, which is see, what I'm most familiar with, and it's what I've, I've um, studied most, I suppose, on my travels. Um, however, when I wrote my book, I also covered on another motivation, which is more fundamental, which is the need to grow food because you need food, and being a guerrilla gardener is the only way of doing it. And there was a very recent article that Reuters published, which I, I just want to read you some highlights about. Just, just to, to remind you of the other aspect to it, which feels very far removed from, from where we are today, which is a story from Mali, where they were describing how in the shadow of foreign hotels, some of them abandoned um, hotels, um, in, which is obviously one of the world's poorest countries, there were guerrilla gardeners, which is how they describe them, and they reference um, the more developed uh, world. Uh, these guerrilla gardeners are, are growing broccoli and cabbage next to the river Niger. They're making pumps to take water out of the river to, to harvest um, their, their to, to water their crops. And they're not only feeding themselves with this, but they're also selling the crops for, for cash. And they describe, using an interesting phrase, the trend of urban farming is growing across the continent, which is the kind of phrase that's used to describe things in, in Europe as well. So I, I just wanted to refer to that because it is a, it's a very recent story. Um, but my emphasis is, is where, where things are, are less desperate for now at least. So we're going to start with um, why people do it for making a point, the, the public expression. So there we go. First example is from Morton Oregon. And this is not Guerrilla Gardening, this is a Mercedes logo outside the dealership. And the Guerrilla Gardener went in to edit to culture jam. Bought a culture jam is how my journalist put it. 
Um, and she told me how that was left unchanged um, for a fortnight. Um, whether the state has noticed or not, perhaps they thought it was adding to their credibility. This, this symbol has been appropriated by all sorts of brands now to sell things, so it perhaps had a mixed message. Um, in the Netherlands, the Green Left Party used guerrilla gardening as a way of um, provoking conversation, gathering interest. So they used fancy dress as a way of um, setting themselves apart and, and creating a stir. Um, pothole guerrilla gardening has taken off in all sorts of places. This is a, an example of um, a guerrilla gardener called Pete. Um, there's a, a, a more a well known one now called Steve, who's written a book about it. And these, of course, are very short bit gardens. Um, playful, <laughs> dangerous, not something I dare do or I'm really that interested in doing. Um, and a recent example here, <laughs> this is from Ukraine. Uh, and it is described by the press there as being done to protest about the holes of the roads, um, which, is, which is a very creative way of doing it. So this is, this is very much at an extreme. And if this is what Guru Garden is all about, I can understand why Critics don't, you know, don't get it, but it's about commitment. And in the UK, it was the <laughs> activity of retailer streets in Parliament Square in, in 2000, on May the 1st, that um, I'm sure has contributed a lot to this. Now, however valid their form of protest, guerrilla gardening here was serving that, that need to create noise, to attract attention, to, to make the point that this green space is ours to, to do something. That this is a canvas. But of course, because it didn't, didn't have any kind of follow through, there was no um, expectation at that point to, to carry on doing it. It, it, it comes with a negative reputation as well. Um, it's been used more recently in some of the Occupy movements, and was also used again actually in 2010 in Parliament Square, where it lasted a bit longer. <coughs> and um, slightly less provocatively, this is the human shrub in Colchester. He uses guerrilla gardening to provoke the council into doing their job. Um, so this is very much about shaming the council and being as, as, as newsworthy as possible, hence the costume. Although a rumour has it that the costume is also a disguise because he, uh, it may be a local councillor of the opposition party, <laughs> didn't want to bring, bring um, the, the current ruling party into disrepute. Um, he, he was very busy about four years ago, and it's just resurfaced again as a new campaign, so the human shrubs on, on the march. But, um, that, so that, that's very much the one side of it. Um, social entertainment is something that I've discovered is a big part of the appeal. The, the unexpected conversations, the excuse to gather people together, to garden together, which would be quite unreasonable if it was my, was my own garden. Um, it's, it's not just community gardening, which is a familiar phrase, uh, phrase, but generally conjures up the idea that you're gardening in a clearly defined space, probably some kind of fenced area that you're members of, and that's your community garden. What guerrilla gardening tends to be is gardening in the community, where the boundaries are much vaguer, and anyone passing by can stop, sometimes even join in, and or at least have a conversation. Occasionally even make a donation. For the first time in years, I a uh, car window was rolled down on, on Sunday afternoon, someone was eager to give me ten pounds, which um, went towards paying for half of the cost of the order that was spreading um, at the time. So the social entertainment is, is, is great fun, and sometimes it goes to an extreme. This is an image I love of um, Miami guerrilla gardeners, a huge group of them doing a tiny piece of gardening. I, I dread to think how chaotic that was during the time, <laughs> from a gardener's point of view, but, but from a, a social point of view. It's, um, I joined in here at an event in Bologna a couple of springs ago. There's a group there um, who gather huge numbers of, of their friends together. It's a big student town. Take on vast areas. Um, I, I got really stressed during this. It was, it was far too chaotic for me. I wasn't sure how, how great the gardening was. And in fact, I was very sceptical. Um, but I was proven completely wrong because I saw photographs of how this looked the following autumn. It was really brilliant. It was thriving in a much more difficult climate than we are lucky enough to have here. And here are some of their, their signage. So for them, it isn't just about the fun. I mean, they, they do, as I said, they care about the garden and they, they want to educate people um, as well about what they're doing and what they're planting. 
Uh, we also, in Bologna that weekend, gathered together for um, the only known international, well, only known national gathering of guerrilla gardeners. I've, I've never dared try and cr create one here, but this was rallying together guerrilla gardeners from Rome, Naples, Milan, um, I think maybe even Sicily. There's definitely a group in, in Palermo, as I learned about a couple of weeks ago. Um, and they wanted to you know, share, share stories, share advice, but they also wanted to find a collective purpose. Um, some of them very politically motivated as well. And actually, I, I try to persuade them that no such focused purpose need be necessary. They were finding it difficult to, to, to reach agreement. And I, I encourage them to, to, to focus on their, on their local needs and what their, what their group's motivations were, and, and to feel comfortable with that, to not have to evolve into some sort of coherent, politicized movement. I haven't, haven't seen that succeeding or would being attempted in the house. And I'm standing there um, next to Fante de Fiore, who I, I mentioned later on. He was, he was a, an odd one out, uh, interesting example. Uh, another group in Los Angeles, very good to the social side. Um, and, and that's a fascinating city. I was there earlier in the year. Los Angeles, almost the, the, the iconic city of being um, separated from each other. You know, it's a motor city. You're not expecting to bump into people on their, on their sidewalks. And, and so gathering spaces that are, are, are public free spaces um, are, are perceived to be quite rare. And so the spaces that the gardeners were tackling were the, the margins on the edge of the freeways. These were the, the biggest opportunity. The sidewalks, what they call the nature strips, are already meant to be the responsibility of homeowners, which is something that I think is tremendous. Um, you, you are responsible already for public space, for gardening beyond your boundaries, albeit until very recently only as an ornamental gardener. So in, in Los Angeles you've got this freeway gardening, um, and here we are doing some succulent planting in, in February. Um, Scott is a, a postman who was doing real gardening for years, he's been doing it since the 80s, on, on his rounds, early in the morning, planting all sorts of gardening. <laughs> Uh, absolutely complete dynamo of energy, amazing man. Um, and, and then there's also uh, more recently Ron Finley, who's a, a YouTube sensation, who's a guerrilla gardener in Los Angeles, very focused on food growing. And, and his campaigning and, and the other guerrilla gardeners and, and many more have helped change the city's law so that now that parkway outside your house can be used to grow edibles as well as ornamentals, which is a really significant achievement in a city that doesn't have perhaps the greatest of reputations for being very um, in, into its public space. So the, the, the final chunk of the Venn diagram um, are the people who do it for the love of gardening. And this was very much my motivation. So we're going to get right back to the beginning of my story now. Um, in a second, actually, I should just give you a few more international examples. This is Luke in Montreal. I, I met him uh, eight years ago. I was there for my brother's wedding. And Luke was actually a city gardener, a city contractor, but he loved gardening so much that he created this from dirt at the back of the, the sidewalk. Really in, incredible, the kind of garden you'd expect in, in the grounds of a stately home. Um, and it brought great, great joy to the neighbouring nursery. Um, Francis de Fiore, I pointed him out earlier, he's the Italian guerrilla gardener who gardens on his own around his village outside Bologna um, passionately for years now, and has been endorsed by the, by the local mayor, his career garden has been legitimised. And he brings fun to it with a lot of these um, deliberately childish, humorous pictures to provoke people into helping out, whether it's watering or not letting their dog foul um, the, the space. Um, has a, a Facebook page which is full of, full of posts. And another lovely story, um, this is from the UK now, um, June took over this little traffic island in her village in Wiltshire. She didn't know she was even a guerrilla gardener. She had the permission of the parish council, but subsequently found out that the county council were the ones who should have been granted permission, and they were very reluctant to do so without her donning the high vis and the men at work signs, which she felt was quite unnecessary given the pavement. Um, and she, she won, her, won her battle using the media. She galvanised the court. And it became a key part of her identity um, when she celebrates her 18th birthday, the garden became uh, a 
and, and so she, she actually recently passed away, but this photo that I, I took of her when I got to meet her was used on her memorial service. So it, it shows what a big part guerrilla gardening can become um, in your life and in your, in your identity. Um, because it touches so many people's hearts in a, in a village like that, it's a very visible contribution. Um, another um, really quite special story um, comes from Liverpool. This is a small part of a network of guerrilla gardens in Toxteth in Cairns Street, which I visited on several occasions at different times of the year and, and met some of the gardeners there. Um, you may be aware this was an area that was due for demolition that the Labour government's Pathfinder scheme um, set aside huge areas of the north to demolish, to try and stimulate the housing market. Um, and these residents weren't too keen on having their homes demolished, so they, they didn't move out very quickly. And to demonstrate their passion for the place and to try and compensate for the otherwise um, you know, derelict landscape around them, they started filling the streets uh, with plants, which is something that more local guerrilla gardeners have done um, in the Haygate estate to make a, a last gasp attempt to demonstrate the value of, of, of those houses and the, and the green landscape within it. So back to my motivations. That, that's why I'm a guerrilla gardener, because that's me and my twin brother um, as three-year-olds gardening in the countryside where I grew up. And so when I found myself um, living here, where I still live in Parent House, quite just down the road at the Elephant Castle, with no garden. Um, my green fingers were itching, and it really was as simple as that. It was just not being satisfied and, and not being interested in finding some uh, far flung allotment or, or community garden. I wanted to be able to garden really on, on, on my doorstep, and the chances were made available with um, Southern Council's institutional neglect. Um, they've forgotten about this as they forget about the infrastructure of our building as well. I've since become a guerrilla painter, a decorator, and <laughs> even an electrician. Um, because it's just quicker to get things done that way. Um, and and would be more cost, well, certainly more cost effective given their tenants and admin charge on everything they do. Um, so this has thrived and, and it's really looking fabulous at the moment. And actually, recently, um, Backside Open Spaces Trust gave us. 400 quid to, to kind of boost this garden even more. They've, they've been very helpful. Because after three years of guerrilla gardening here, um, a bit of argy bargy with the council, the contractors had, had um, come in and given it a, 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 a rather brutal hacking one summer. I managed to negotiate permission. And it was an awkward conversation where the contractors were, were blaming the council for not having been reminded about the job, and the council were blaming the contractors. Um, and neither of them really wanted to give us permission. But I, I made it difficult for them, got a lot of support. Um, and so they granted it. And at the time, they refunded us for three years' worth of grounds maintenance charges that, of course, they'd been fraudulently billing all the residents for, including my landlord. Um, sadly, subsequently, um, uh, an incredibly um, cost effective employee at Southern Council called Martin Green, who, who really must be treasured by the council because he can. He can, excuse my language, he can screw residents for money um, by reading the red tape. And, and he managed to find a way to still charge us for the gardening, even though the council uh, don't do it, um, which they, they charge us to this day. Um, but we have permission, which makes it possible to get, to get grants, and it's still a huge source of um, advice, um, you know, pleasure, despite Martin Green's um, delight. Martin's even sent me photos of his garden, <laughs> to show me how much he loves gardening. Try, try to make it, try to make it, uh, connect with it. There we go. Um, that's that's, that's what's on the doorstep. And then once you get success in one place, the, the green fingered itchy gardener in the ear, I'm sure gardeners will, will relate to this, can't perhaps help themselves but try some other challenges. So when Transport for London resurfaced the pavement down London Road, um, I went in at night before they put the sand around the base of the trees and, and put a lot of topsoil in. And it, it, a lot of the topsoil actually came from the Haygate estate. So I quite like the fact that we were reclaiming this in public uh, land before it was sold to the Australians. And um, we planted it up with mint at the time, which I thought would be a good idea because mint, of course, is, is very vigorous and, and also takes over. So constrained in these tree pits thought it would be quite good. It did look great, and it was free. It was donated by um, a, a rum brand who were keen to be doing something entertaining. 
and encourage people to make the heat up. So it's a, I'm not mentioning their name, I have no, no need to do that. Um, anyway, the mint didn't really work out very well because it's deciduous and it looked really messy. So we've upgraded it since with um, raised beds, which have worked much better. They retain the water, more, more um, food for the plants, and, and safer from the tramping of the pedestrians. So they, they go through waves of looking great. They're, they're still quite tough to look after, but, but um, they've been doing pretty well. So that's, that's London Road. And no, there's no, no labelling, no branding, nothing on that. I'm sure many people who walk past assume it's the work of Southern Council and the TFL, and so be it. Um, let them take the credit. It means that they're less likely to, to find a reason to, to remove them. That's a more recent photo from a couple of weeks ago with the wallflowers and the, the drainage and, and the alley on it as well. Um, now, in Lambeth, things are different. You'll have noticed me and Southern Council don't get on too well. In Lambeth, it's completely different. Lambeth really gets it. And as I said, they, they'd be inspired by what was going on outside it to get me down, to hear my pitch, to, to meet the chief executive and contractors. And they, they've um, developed a scheme called Fresh View that's partly inspired by the Garden, where residents can request help in transforming tree pits in their streets. So they cut through the red tape, they cut through all the kind of grant application um, business that can put a lot of people off, and they make it possible. And this is some of the um, resident-led activity that's not a guerrilla garden, but it's very closely related to in, in Lambeth. And this is in West Norwood. This is um, Val from uh, uh, Best Bank Size, who lives down there. A great supporter, should be able to do a bit of um, pavement gardening um, near her patch. And then the successful, the Edible Bus Stop project, um, in Lambeth wouldn't be possible without, without Lambeth Council support. So it begs the question, why aren't Southwark doing it? And um, given the local audience here, I, I sort of get stuck into this little mini case study, and Claire, who's here at the front, uh, played a really valuable part in trying to make this happen as well. Um, Claire uh, used to live more locally than she does now, um, identified a wonderful new piece of the streetscape. A lot of money had been spent on putting some new landscaping and new trees tree pits perfect for the garden and went to a lot of trouble to get council permission to, to, for us to do it. This is a Trinity Street, on the junction of Trinity Street and Great Dover Street, near, near the pub. And, and so with council permission, not as good a garden, you can actually see um, a, a councillor there, we, we started doing the garden. And, and this was the start of a project that I thought would hopefully lead to the borough-wide, maybe London-wide adoption of, of such a scheme. And it initially went very well, and the garden um, has thrived. Um, um, but then uh, a brutal attack took place because um, Southern Council, despite the fact that they granted permission, uh, are so incompetent with their internal communications, um, or, or on the wavelength to even value this kind of creation, that they, they brutally hacked it. And whilst they didn't completely destroy it, um, they, they cleared out a lot of what we'd done. And, and if we were in any doubt as to who had done it, the evidence was there in the bags, and I actually went through them and salvaged some of the, 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 the parts. So as a result of this, um, Claire and I went a little bit on the, on the war path to try and turn this, this very depressing setback into an opportunity. Um, and it ended up, actually, I had two meetings with Councillor Peter John, who to this day, remarkably, is still the leader of Southern Council. Um, and here I am with him and his cabinet member of the communities at the time. But we, here we are in, in Lambeth, because what I managed to do, got him round, you know, pitched to him the fresh view idea, pavement gardening, got him into Lambeth to come to one of these events with Lambeth um, Council contractors and try and inspire him. Um, it just seemed like a no-brainer to me. The council has had until recently a cleaner, greener, safer scheme where people can apply for money, but it's very bureaucratic, it's very slow, it's just not suited to the kind of activity that, that this is, that, that could be a lot simpler. Anyway, um, it went absolutely nowhere. He just, he came along, it went just straight into the, into the trash can. Um, so in fact, the Lamb and Southwark's gone backwards since, because they've now scrapped Clean Green Safe altogether and centralised it even more into one sort of all-purpose community spot, which um, is really, really disappointing. Um, I made a grant application to pilot this in Southern, um, and it was rejected in its entirety. It didn't even give us half the budget to sometimes do. So Southern are just so disappointed. Um, 
Now we're into the, into the battles. I think, give me the positive. That was one battle, that was a battle I definitely lost. This is another battle that isn't over yet. Um, it, it's quite exciting and you might be able to help. This is St George's Circus in 2005. Um, Shabby bit of TFL land. We've been gorilla gardening it, lavender, bay, formium, this is for all sorts of plants, tulips. Um, here we are, the Bina bonariensis, and wonderful double hollyhocks. Really bleak bit of um, the dual carriageway here um, transformed. Quite an unpleasant place to work on, but once we started, I, I felt committed. Anyway, as you may be aware, it's now gone. Um, and in anticipation of its demise, I, I began removing plants. We harvested our Christmas tree, used it in the foyer of the house this Christmas. Um, and here it was a few days before its, its um, demolition. Um, we went in and salvaged as much as we could. And the Austin Maxi is a wonderful vehicle, as I think so um, Large bay tree. We, we, we replanted these in, in containers around the house. Though sadly, they, I, I gave up and removed them about a week ago. They, they, they did well for a while, but they were too mature to successfully move. Um, so it was a great loss, but I've tried to use this to, to wing around the CFL to a new idea. Um, this is their, this is a very upsetting picture, just talking about that. Um, it's, it's to get them to embrace the idea of a nature superhighway, because all this change, all this demolition is because they're putting in a cycle superhighway. So the big, big idea is a nature superhighway to go alongside it. And this is the track record. This is a nature superhighway that I planted on Denmark Hill, which continues to thrive. And here it is in its spring mode, and in summer it's full of sunflowers. It can look a bit scrappy at times, but it is a really spectacular sight at its peak. Um, here's another one, more locally, on Stephen Street, separating the cycle lane from the road. So that, that's really what we mean by the nature superhighway. Where they're putting in all this segregated cycle routes, we can be planting that up rather than having hard landscaping. And if it can be done in an area where there's no interest in, in, in looking off public space, no reason why that could be done safely, particularly if the, if the curve is so wide that you can actually have pavement and then the garden in the middle, so you're not even having to stand in the road or the cycleways. So um, it is the same place before and after. So this is the idea. So George's Road, over the next few weeks, is going to have a whole lane of traffic removed, which is brilliant, and it will be replaced with a, a two-way cycle track instead. But where the medium strip is, I, I'm so keen that they, they put in some open soil, dig out the tarmac, put in some open soil, even if it's not a continuous strip, a few patches would make a huge difference um, to the aesthetics, to the, the, the ability of the nature to have its kind of hopping points along the road here, and I think also to the sense of calm um, of, of all the users of that space. But it's been an incredibly difficult battle. Put a proposal together, I've had now three meetings with TfL. Initially, their designer said, well, we're trying to encourage horizontal movement here. We don't want, we don't want you know, linear obstruction. I said, what do you mean? You know, horizontal movement. This is a this is a one-way road. Why are there So they thought, oh, you're talking about shared space. You want pedestrians to be you know wandering across, as is now fashionable in a lot of spaces. You want pedestrians to be you know, hopping onto the median strip and then across the dual carriageway. Or, or do you want us to be using the crossing? He said, oh no, 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 no. It's definitely not shared space here. No, you're right. No, no, we do want them to use the crossing. So well, why not then? You know, the plants will actually discourage that kind of wandering. Well, I'd say the aesthetic argument was one. I, I, I succeeded, and I think mean, it's sad to do it, but I succeeded in making it look very stupid. Um, he wasn't even able to describe what the local area was like. You know, this man has had to do the cycle super highway design from, from here to King's Cross, so he hadn't paid a great deal of attention to the, to, to the context. The issue now remains a matter of health and safety, which I think we've resolved, um, and, and then just cost and practicality. And who knows? It, it's a very live issue. The contractors that have begun work I'm still keeping my fingers crossed. So if anyone has any contacts with Transport for London, with your local politicians, with people in the GLA, um, please spread the word. Simply Nature Superhighway, Google it, there's a film on YouTube. Um, it's so simple. If we can do it here, then perhaps we can do it in other parts of London. And another, um, I'm nearly concluded now, another spin-off that's come about through, through campaigning. Um, the Green Gardening I alluded to in the Haygate estate, in, in the huge council estate that's since been demolished, um, that led to dialogue with the developers. They realised that there was an enthusiasm for gardening 
on this land, and that it would be unnecessary for them to exclude gardeners from it during their 15-year development cycle, when a lot of land would be sitting idle. So um, they offered a space, but it would need to be short-term, and hence the need for us to be mobile gardeners. So mobile gardeners is the sort of legitimate spin-off of guerrilla gardening. It's, it's when we step up to take on a lease and a license and, and try and do things in a, in a more conventional way, which has been a fascinating challenge. Um, and this was the first space they offered us. Um, not, not one of the green spaces in the Haygate, but right at the bottom of Wansey Street. This is it in, in winter 2011. Um, they, there they are, um, Southwark Council and, and Lendley's meeting myself, and I developed this project with a a uh, local Latin architect called Paul McGann. Um, you know, I run it as volunteers. Um, and gradually getting people in the community, local in the streets and beyond in, to, to start creating uh, these mobile gardens, uh, mini allotments that can be transported as and when the site changes. And here are a few photos um, taken over the, the two and a half years that that location thrived. Uh, we managed to retain a small portion of it when the, um, the cycle of development moved on and the, the road will be going in here. Um, so we've managed to retain a portion of it. We then moved most of the contents to the other end of the street, onto the old Shell petrol station behind the building. And just two weeks ago, most of it has moved again to a brand new location on New Kent Road, um, which is going to be called Grow Elephant. Um, we designed a great logo for it, and um, then they sort of put it on the hoarding. Um, but they forgot to put a gate in the hoarding for us to get in. So then they had to take the, they basically had to chop the logo in half to put the gate in. So there isn't actually any very clear signage at the moment. We hope that they'll find a way to sign back up. Such are the challenges of, of dealing with a, a, a large developer. But they, they, they kind of get it. Um, they tolerate us. Um, and, and things are eventually happening. So if anyone's interested in getting involved in that space, we need all hands to the deck. Paul's running running for elephants, I'm supporting a bit and focusing on, on, the, on the remaining patch here at, at Wansey Street. Um, and yeah, which is, which is illustrated here. And you can find out more about our conference. So there we go. Thank you very much. It's not East Dulles WI. I gave a different presentation. I'm sorry, I amended that slide. <laughs> <laughs> I'm to finish. Um, let, let me finish on a different, let me show you another image. There we go. There we go, that's a nice, that's a nice, that's a nice, that's a nice.